Welcome, everybody, to the Far Post Podcast presented by Esports Gaming League. You know, sometimes I, I like to do the intro and say, welcome, my friends, but one, let's be don't honest, I don't, don't have any friends. Yep. And I'll be honest, right now, we haven't done a show in so long. I'm not sure that our listeners currently feel as if we are their friends. And I'd I want to get that the back. the cool vibe in the intro, too. I'd forgotten all about that. Yeah, I want to I get that friendship back. It's been too long. You have to put in a lot of effort to be, do that. Be a better mm. person, Jeff. Yeah, if you got to try, there. if you got to try hard and be a better person, I am. That's zero for two. Two yep. strikes against me already, right off the bat. But it has it has been kind of a weird start to the season, right? Which we, everyone uh, who follows the New England Revolution kind of know. Been uh, canceled games, midweek games, buys already. It's just been it's been a weird it's been a weird start to the year. Snowstorms. I was I gonna say weather. I Add that to the I list. I swearing. Really hope. <laughs> yeah, so much swearing. Yeah. Let's start over. Yes, can we? Can we etch a sketch this thing and start again? I'm, yeah, Jeff. I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, based on what I've seen throughout the course of the first couple of months, we, I think we can swear on the Far Post podcast now. I, I think believe can we can. That. Yes. I think you can do that. Let's oh, test guys, it. my mom is not going to be happy oh. if I'm on a swearing <laughs> podcast. Oh, I'm going to throw that out there right now. <laughs> okay. Well, it's like that Mitch Hedberg joke when he's like, they told me I could swear on Sirius XM. And I was like, of course you can. Nobody's listening anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, I'm still hosting the show. I'm still Jeff Lemieux. Yep, can't still shake here. you. I Boo. apologize. Boo you, <laughs> sir. Try to shake myself every single day. Just yep. can't. I mean, they coughed for you a few times recently, so I don't know. Yeah, which was weird. There was a weird vibe silence. there. I know. Yeah, the door. The door. Oh, wait, did you open the door? There we go. Hey. Oh, wow. Yeah. We got Good morning. <laughs> I mean, Kahal, this is like this is you nonsense. Have, you, how many appearances did you have last this year, is actually? nonsense. Because they, they changed. They changed their tone. Oh, your Whoa. microphone. The microphone just decided to cut <laughs> yeah. me off. Oh, That's man. karma. The, <laughs> the microphone's like, yeah, I'm just going to get yeah, away I'm from out, this. I'm out, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> well, Cahal, uh, Cahal Conlon's here. Hello. Us on the show. It's great to be back. For the first time in 2022, right? A long time. Yeah. The first time in feels like a long time. Yeah. yeah. I think yep. your last appearance was the playoff preview show oh, last year. Oh, God. A long time well, ago. Well, that was when we wow. did the brand. How, I'm wondering, how many times were you on last year? Because it was only a handful, right? Like, oh, no, yeah. Yeah. It's just a crazy know. schedule with the, all the games so quickly. Yeah. yeah, it's been nuts. But hopefully we can get back into some sort of a regular rotation here. Yeah. We shall I see. think we can. We've got Elizabeth Pahota with us. Hello, everybody. And I don't know if anybody can see, but Elizabeth's wearing jeans today, and I wanted to point it out because I don't think, I think this is the first time in five years that I've worked with Elizabeth that she's wearing jeans. And it totally threw me off this morning. Wow. It like, is. Wow. I don't wear jeans very often, <laughs> ever. And a company actually sent them to me, and I thought, oh. I'll try them out. But they have some sparkles on them, if anyone is curious about that. Mm. My boyfriend called them fancy jeans, so they weren't <laughs> quite as casual. Well, there, is, there are degrees of jeans. Yeah. Sure. Fancy <laughs> jeans is certainly a category. Yeah. I don't own any fancy jeans. I Maybe I should jeans. get some. I don't know what you call those. <laughs> I, I'd say if jeans have sparkles on them, they, they're indeed fancy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, th- I mean, go he had way. a good analysis, I thought. Yeah. I was like, okay, fancy, fancy jeans. Fancy jeans, we'll go with mom that. jeans, dad jeans. There you go. Skinny jeans. S- these are also skinny jeans, yeah. Categories. White jeans. They have white jeans, colored jeans. Yeah, white jeans are... Mm. Yeah, different strokes for different folks, That's right. right. That's <laughs> right. You don't think you can pull off the white I, jeans? I certainly cannot pull <laughs> off white jeans. I see a lot of people wear white <laughs> jeans that can't pull them off, but I certainly can't. That's for sure. Right. I Round- know my limits. <laughs> there you go. That's, good. That's uh, always a good place to start. Yep. Uh, and rounding out the group, Jason Downerpole. I, I'm also wearing jeans, but I guess because I'm a dad, they're dad jeans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> saying not yeah. no escaping I appreciate it. that. Quite so fancy yeah. jeans. Yeah. Then there's like cargo jeans. Right, they're like a cross between cargo pants and oh, jeans. Oh yeah, no, I don't know those. There's like ones. the jeggings, the cross between Ex- jeans yes, and leggings. Yes, yeah, yes. there's wow. a lot. Yes, I've heard of jeggings. I don't think I've heard of cargo jeans. Oh yeah, they have the extra <laughs> pockets in the sides and stuff. Yeah, uh, I had those in the nineties. I understand yeah. the, car- the the concept of cargo pants. I just don't yeah. think I've ever seen them they're, on jeans. They're denim cargo pants. Yeah. <laughs> would yes. we would we get into the category of calling like overalls in this category of jeans? I don't own any overalls, but like I'm just curious, how far do you kind of bring these categories? You know what overalls are called where I grew up? No. Dungarees. Dungarees. Yeah. I kind of like that word better. We well, used to call just jeans dungarees I know. back in the yeah. day. Huh, interesting. Yep. That is interesting. interesting. Yeah. Wow. Totally different. If you put on your dungarees and your jumper, you guys would be all confused. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, uh, I, we Great could be back. I would say we could spend the entire show talking about jeans because it might be preferable uh, to some of the other oh, stuff we're going to talk about. Totally fair. It, it, we're we're going to have to talk about uh, the recent run results at some point. So let's we rip off the band aid, right? We'll yeah. just get to it, rip off the band aid. Real quick, real quick. Uh, look, the Revs have suffered four straight losses in all competitions and. Not even upsetting, it's just perplexing. Goal. We, we were texting a little bit after the 1 0 loss to the New York Red Bulls on yeah. Saturday night. And when you think of this run of four straight losses and you take each individual loss 
on its own and think of the context of each individual loss. It's almost an inconceivable run of four losses packed together into a four-game losing streak over the course of a couple of weeks because you've got a 2-0 lead over Salt Lake that you end up losing 3-2. First time in 15 years the Revs had seen a 2-0 lead slip away at home in a loss. You've got what happened in Mexico stays in Mexico. Everybody yep. knows what happened in Mexico City yep. uh, with the result down there. You got the 3-1 loss to Charlotte, which, you know, on the face of it, you know, that's an expansion team that obviously was going to be up for that game, but you never want to be the first the first loss to an expansion team. And then just maybe the most bizarre of all of them, the 1-0 loss to the Red Bulls on this insane own goal on mm-hmm. Saturday night. So I, I just, it's it's almost inconceivable that these four games had happened on the trot. I've never seen anything like it in any in any of the teams or leagues I've watched and followed in my in my brief time on this planet, um, I've never seen anything like it. It's 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 I can't even get mad with it. I don't I don't know what to make of it. Like when when the own goal went in uh, in the last game, I just started laughing. I, I don't I don't know how to process that. I don't. This has just been so absurd. I mean, and you cause you sort of go step by step, and you take the Salt Lake game, and you're like, okay, well, I mean, the snow's ridiculous. It's hard to pin anything on that because it was a nonsense game. Should you have lost the game? No, but you know, it's hard to read anything into that. And then the Mexico thing happens, and you're like, oh, yeah, it's tough going into Mexico. And you start to try to justify everything. And then, like, uh, the expansion team, you can start. And then you put all four together. You're like, it's absurd. It's absolutely absurd that this happened. I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. I know you don't over. It's, it, you don't overreact. It's still early. I know all that. But it's still also it's still also hard to to think that that's, that's okay. Because it's not, it's weird. I don't, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> I just don't know what to do with it. Yeah, I feel like when you look at it in context, the weirdest part is that, you know, last year we only had four losses in general. And then you get to this year, and while they're in all competitions, you have four consecutive losses. So it's crazy. I know it's, you're talking about all the different uh, circumstances with the games, but I don't know. I feel like it's a really weird string, and I think you need a powerful game to kind of snap that. Like, I don't even think that it can necessarily just be a win. I feel like to, to, to totally change the tone and get the confidence back, I feel like you need a really confident win. And I think this group's capable of it because they've been balancing a ton of injuries, and there's been logistics with the travel, the schedule, the weather. There's been all of these things. But we did talk to Brad Knighton earlier this week, and he said, you know, he listed a bunch of them off and basically said, but at the end of the day, those are all excuses, and we got to get back on the horse. And he's right. Like, there, there are excuses for all those games, but you got to do something about it so I think this game against Miami is going to be extremely important for kind of changing that tone it better be because if it isn't then everyone has my permission to smash their panic buttons well, that's the thing. yeah the <laughs> Miami's not doing too hot either <laughs> oh so my god we'll yeah we'll talk about that game uh, a little bit later in the show but it certainly feels like it's an inflection point right yeah like it's that that game yeah. could be a potential inflection point um, what I think is interesting, though, is I thought like this last game was an inflection point, so I feel like we keep kicking the can down the road. Well, that's what, you, that's what I, you're I always going to do, right? I mean, you look, yeah. I mean, you sort of look at the schedule and you thought, okay, we got some very winnable games yeah, coming up here. Exactly. We should be able to right the ship. And then, exactly. And then you don't, and you're like, okay, well, okay, we'll take this care of it this game. weekend. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, God, you know, at what point do you, yeah. Well, yeah. The, the fact is, too, I think there's no question that this current run of results stings more and kind of you're feeling the weight of it more because of the way 2021 went. Sure. And the fact that, like Elizabeth mentioned, you know, we didn't come anything close to a stretch like this Mm -hmm. last year. There were times, maybe not Elizabeth while you've been here, I know the Revs had obviously a pretty (laughs) difficult run of results at the start of the 2019 season. You bring up 2011, I'm going to punch in your face. Before (laughs) Bruce Arena joined. But like there have been times where we've been here, Cajal and Jadal, where a four-game losing streak, you almost wouldn't even have batted an eyelash. It's fine. It's just what you expected to happen on a week-to-week basis in years like 2011. The fact that this is no longer acceptable, this is absolutely not the norm, this is not what this team should be doing, like, that's that's a good thing. Um, but it definitely feels like you're feeling it a little bit more right now just because it's been a few years since we've felt anything yeah, like Yeah, I think, look, going into the season, I don't think anybody anybody looked at it and said, I fully expect the Revs to get 73 points again and win the Sporter Shield and be dominant. Yeah. No. You, you expected a drop-off, but I don't, I don't think we expected to be to get punched in the face with the drop-off. Yeah, <laughs> like, well, God, it's, it's April, you're like, what? what well, I think <laughs> also t- to go with it, too, is, you know, one of the major storylines over the last couple of months in the offseason, due, and, and due to also it being so short as well, is that there wasn't a lot of roster turnover. So you brought back most of your starters, and, you know, you have anti- anticipated moves later this season obviously Turner's going to Arsenal so you you figure oh we have this time where we get to like really cement ourselves in the standings with most of the same players so it's just interesting that with most of the same roster coming back we're seeing this so early but it also could build character and kind of teach them teach them a hard-fought lesson so you know maybe it's good it's happening now and they're going to get hot later in the year um 
Well, There's to that end, I have a silver lining for you. I love silver linings. So we did. I was chatting with Kurt on Awful, and he reminded us that I might get the years wrong. It's either 11, 12, or 12, 13 with the Galaxy. And they were really had a really successful season, came back the next year, and were bottom of the standings in late May, June, and went on to win MLS Cup. You got so it. he said, don't panic. We did also say, please don't fall to the bottom of the standings. Yeah. <laughs> we can avoid that. But he did say, don't panic. It's not ideal, but it's way too early to panic. We'll be fine. Well, in the year of 2019, too, same, I mean, different situation, but applying it to the Revs, you know, they had the coaching change when Bruce came in. And I think looking at the, uh, it must have been like, are you advocating for a regime change, Elizabeth? No, I'm absolutely <laughs> not advocating for a regime change. But I'm saying when Bruce came in, uh, I think it was 538, they had some sort of stat out there that the Revs have like a 96% chance of not making the postseason. And then we went on with Bruce to, to make ourselves get in there. So, you know, things can happen and things can turn around. Uh, but I just remember that stat of being like, oh, man, we already blew it and it's June. Like, <laughs> that sucks. And then, you know, the Revs, they went on a run and they, they did the thing. What yeah. was the year of the 1%? When was that? We are the 1%. That was 2013. It was 13? Yeah. 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 And the, the revs were given, I believe, by, uh, was it by Matt Doyle? Yes. And Matt Doyle gave there a so. 1% chance to win MLS Cup, which I guess in fairness we did lose to Sporting Kansas City. Yeah. <laughs> we ended up winning MLS Cup that year. Yeah. Um, but gave gave Sporting KC a, a good run. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, at where, whereas last year you had to, to, in order to have a 73 point season, you have to have so much fall in place for you. Sure. Right? You have to be a very, very good team. The Revs had an historically good season last year, but you also have to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. Schedule has to fall your way a little bit. You've, the Revs won 19 one-goal games last year. Like any team who's going to set a single-season points record, some things are going to have to fall your way. Yeah. And last year, it seemed like a lot of things fell into place for the Revs, and now this year it feels like it's all coming back <laughs> through these last four games. <laughs> Nothing has fallen into place for the Revs. You're getting almost the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, but I, I don't want to forget, too, it, it was a pretty solid start to this season for the Revs. Yeah. Go on the road to Portland. You pick up the 2-2 yep. draw. Uh, that was a game where, you know, that one you could have ended up winning that game. You could have ended up losing that yeah. game. Draw felt like the right result, but a good point to go get at yep. the defending Western Conference champions. You come home, you're able to grind out a 1-0 win over FC Dallas. Then you put together that performance at home against Pumas. Which is as well as I've seen any Revs team play <laughs> ever. And that's what I was going to say. You told me after the final whistle, you said, that's the best game I've seen from the Revolution, not just this current iteration of players, but maybe from this club yep. at any point in terms of a complete 90-minute dominant performance. Mm -hmm. That was like a month ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little did we know. <laughs> then you go out and you take the 2-0 lead over Salt Lake. And it looks like you're rolling to another win. And it's kind of, obviously, over the last three and a half games, it's kind of fallen apart from there. But I still very much believe, based on what we saw through the first three and a half games, especially with that win over Pumas and the potential that's there for this group, I still feel very much like the this group is is closer to the first three and a half games of the season than the last three uh, Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And I, th I think to be able to put in that level of performance they did in that first leg was, I mean, that's that's who the squad is. Um, that's who certainly they, who they should be. That's who they should be. That's who I think I believe they will be. Um, and you just got to sort of manage through this this blip um, and, and get there. But to your point, Elizabeth, right, the blip has to end yeah. at some point, right? Um, and it's not like you're, the schedule hasn't been unkind to try and dig out of this. Now, you, you have a very, very winnable game mm -hmm. on Saturday that you have to take care of. Um, we've handled this team in the past. So... You know, it's it. The schedule is there for you to, to dig out of this. So it's now is now is the time. Yeah, you won't be wrong. Injuries are, are tricky, right? And you're certainly missing some firepower for sure. Got people back at the back and lost people up front. Um, so it's challenging. It's not as easy as it could have been, but yeah, we need to we need to <laughs> give them right the ship. But at some point, we'll right the ship. At some point. Yeah, I think this weekend is, like you said, Kahal, a very good opportunity. Um, you know, they had a five-goal win against Miami last year. And, frankly, Miami's a team that's also really struggling. They're on a four-game losing streak in the regular season, and they've only picked up one point, still searching for their first win. So there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of reason to capitalize and that you could take advantage down there. But, uh, you know, it just gets to the point where it's like, okay, it, it makes it uh, tougher if you lose this one. And, uh, but then you have the game against Charlotte, the expansion team that's traveling coming up. So at least there's a couple opportunities to, to fix that blip in the near future. And hopefully it's just sooner rather than later. And it better be because if you don't know two games, then it's full on panic. Yeah. <laughs> full yeah. on panic. And it is. It's a, big, it's a big test of character because, like we said, this team didn't deal with – anything rem remotely like this last year. You had that little blip at the end of June, early July, where you lose to Dallas and Toronto, 
sandwiched around a 2-2 draw in Columbus in which you had a 2 nothing lead yep. that you saw slip away. That was by far the worst three-game stretch we saw from the Revs last year. They responded from there to, I think, then lose one game the rest of the, rest of the entire yep. season. Um, so this is a big test of character, but it is a group that has a lot of veteran guys in that room. Uh, Bruce Arena, obviously, as we mentioned, uh, you know, he's, he's leading the charge. He's used to this. Um, but when we spoke with Sebastian Legette yesterday, I did love the quote that he gave when he said, you know, Bruce Arena has taught, taught him. When you're in a high, you should never be a 10. Yeah. When you're low, you should never be a 2. You should always be a 6 or a 7. And it feels like this group kind of understands that. Um, they're pushing forward. They know what they need to do. Sebastian just said, you got to stay positive through stretches like this. I know, And I know that's not really what people – a lot of people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear, well, oh, you just got to stay positive and keep fighting and keep going. But the reality is that is actually what you have yeah, to do. Yeah, that's what those guys have to do. Yeah, yeah. Within, the, within the room, that's what they have to do. Yeah. They, have yep. to, they have to go game to game. They got to have short memories. Um, you know, the, it's the fans' job to panic and overreact, right? That's what, that's what we all and have And that's to all do. part of it, too. Yes. Like, I don't want to take that away from yeah, people. No. Of course. That's their job, yeah. That's what they're supposed to do, that's right? Their job. It's, that's they professional sh- sports. Yeah, they should be critical. They should be worried. Um, that's, that's fine. That's, that's part of their job, yeah. But, yeah. Those those guys in the locker room, they're paid to go game to game. They're, they're, and they're, to your point, some of the veteran leadership that was brought in in the off season have been there and done that, and have have had great success. And they've had periods of, of strife, and they work through it. And that's just some of the experience they'll bring with them. When you say game to game, I don't know why, but the first thing that's popping into my head is the goldfish. Sure, you know, like that sort of situation. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that uh, that Short really obviously everybody you know, jumped on that line from, from Ted Lasso and said, be a goldfish, but that's really what it is. And we hear that in different iterations all the time from professional athletes, right? You got to have a short memory. You got to have a short memory. I have a good reverse goldfish story if you're interested. Oh yeah. I'll try and make it fast. Okay. Um, I was really fortunate uh, in in my previous life, um, to eat in a Michelin star kitchen, like in a a chef's table in the kitchen. I'm watching Michelin star chef operate it. And one of the guy's jobs was all he had to do is bring the butter. That's all he had to do. And he kept forgetting to bring the butter. And his name was James. I'll never forget it. And the chef turned around. He's a big Dutch guy. And he's like, James, are you in goldfish? And he's like, what are you talking about, chef? He's like, you have like a seven-second memory. You just wander around the place with your head up your ass. You know where the butter is. Just bring me the f- butter. Stop being a goldfish. <laughs> so then my kids come full circle now to be a goldfish. In his life, it was don't be a goldfish. <laughs> yeah. I guess that can apply in both situations. You know, if somebody's operating on you, you don't want someone who's going to forget what they're right, doing. Right, right, right. <laughs> but for athletes to move right. on. It makes sense. I guess that's why ignorance is bliss, right? Because yeah. James, seven seconds later, he doesn't remember that he got yelled at by the head <laughs> oh, chef. Oh, no, he's, he's fine. fine. He's fine. He's like, why is he yelling at me again? What? It's, yeah, doesn't he's care. He's good to go. Doesn't care. Well, along the lines of staying positive, because Sebastian Legette told us we got to stay positive. So give me, give me a reason why this team, we should not be panicking, and what we saw over the course of the last three and a half games is not this team, and they're closer to what we saw over those first three and a half games. I think, I mean, one of the main reasons is they've been so injury ridden over yep. the last couple of weeks. And we haven't really, for instance, you're going to see, we saw a lot of people on the back line, like John Bell and Omar Gonzalez. They hadn't even played together before they started in their first game. Like they didn't play together in preseason because it wasn't anticipated that Andrew Farrell and Henry Kessler were both going to be dealing with injuries at the same time. Could that have potentially happened later in the season? Sure. And that's why they have depth at the center back position. But um, I think injuries has been the the main thing. We've seen a lot of players dealing with injuries right now. Um, we know that Gustavo Bo came off in uh, in Mexico in that game. We know that, you know, Farrell took a couple games off, resting a knock, and now he, he's gotten some fitness back. Henry just got some fitness back coming back from his, his injury. So, and obviously Matt Turner as well. So I think they're just dealing with injuries all over the field right now. And like, it's difficult to kind of manage that when it's all over the field, you know, it's challenging when you even have one of your star players that's not in the lineup, but to have all of those holes is, is a challenge. And I think that, you know, they're trying to get players bigger minutes, but also with the way that preseason worked out with CONCACAF and those games, not being um, just being played in general, they didn't have the time to really, acclimate everybody to rotating in those positions with each other. So I think they're starting to figure it out. It's unfortunate that it's manifested in these sort of results, but I think they're still gaining confidence and it's going to come together. And as those players are becoming more healthy all over the field, we're going to see improvements. Um, Cause it only takes a couple moments to impact a game is with, 
regards to game changing opportunities. And I think that they've been very close. And unfortunately, they've been a little unlucky. Like we've been talking about with some of the circumstances, the own goal is a perfect example. They almost put together like a 90 minute performance where they had that clean sheet. Um, we're doing well on the attacking front and, and creating opportunities, just not finishing them. And that one just felt really unlucky to me. So I think they're getting there and we've seen positive signs. And that was something that Richie Williams said this week too, is they've been, they've been creating those moments. They just haven't been able to kind of put them all together. So I'm hopeful that moving forward they're going to be able to do so but I think the the biggest challenge has been the injuries and once you move past that it's a positive that they'll have healthy players on the field and they'll be able to put together some results from there yeah and I think it's fair to look at both sides of that injury storyline right because of course anytime we talk about injuries and players missing you're talking about depth and you've got yeah. to be able to bring players off the bench who can come in do the job get your results we saw the Reds do that throughout the course of the 2021 season and then you can even look at that Salt Lake game as the Rebs were rotating in the midst of Champions League matches, made nine changes to the lineup mm -hmm. in the Salt Lake game. They came in and had a 2-0 lead into the late stages of that game, and it was actually when they went to some more of the starters that they ended up conceding the three goals at the end. So like, the depth is there. This team should have been performing better over the course of the past four games. They should have been getting better results. But at the same time, it is certainly worth, worth it to acknowledge the fact that, yeah, we haven't really seen at any point yet this mm -hmm. season the Revs' first choice 11 altogether. Maybe the closest thing was the Pumas game, and that was the game where they Good. looked their best. Um, so I think there is hope there of saying, you know, when this team can get themselves fully onto the field, fully healthy, there is, there is a contending team within this group. But at the same time, it's fair to say, when you're missing a few of those guys, you still got to be able to put in the performances and get results. I'll give you my reasons to stay positive. There's two of them, Bruce Arena and Carlos Heel. They're both too good at what they do. Yeah, It'll that's fix fair. itself. That's fair. That's fair. Well, uh, in terms of talking about the personnel on the team as well, we know there are going to be some changes come summertime because we know Matt Turner is leaving for Arsenal at the end of June, early July. But there was some news at the goalkeeper position earlier on Wednesday morning. Uh, there was making a move to address the goalkeeper position with the signing of 22-year-old Serbian Jorge Petrovic. And we have confirmation from the Serbian himself <laughs> that it's, not, it's more Jorge not so, not so much Georgie, Georgie, Georgie Petrovic. Uh, Bruce Arena had said when the Rebs announced that Matt Turner was going to be leaving for Arsenal in the summer that they were going to take some time to analyze the goalkeeper position. They were going to determine whether the future of the goalkeeper position was already in-house, whether they needed to go outside to bring someone in. Obviously, they decided to go out and make this move to bring in Georgie Petrovic um, from Serbia. Look at some of his statistics. This is a 22-year-old goalkeeper who's already got a ton of first-team experience. 33 clean sheets in 86 appearances across all competitions, including 18 shutouts in 34 games last year. It's more than 50% of his starts resulted in clean sheets. He's already made his senior national team debut with Serbia, playing under, at the time, caretaker manager Ilya Stolica, former New England Revolution forward. Um, he's expected to join up with the Revs and get settled in the coming weeks as he uh, completes his international transfer, certi transfer certificate and his P1 visa. Um, so, Elizabeth, I'll start with you. Just thoughts on uh, the Revs making this move, bringing in Georgie Petrovic to be, as presumed, at some point once he settles in, the starting goalkeeper for the New England Revolution. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because you don't typically see a team that has five goalkeepers on their roster. And I think that it's, you know, they're really searching for what they're going to do when Turner leaves. And I think that they're bringing in a young goalkeeper that they can mold to kind of fit in their system, can learn from Turner while he's still here, and also work under Kevin Hitchcock, who's been incredible um, being able to coach and mentor all of the goalkeepers that they currently have. So I think they're bringing somebody in not only for when you mentioned that taking over that starting role at some point, but also for the future. I think they want somebody that's going to be the guy, someone that's going to take over and be a steady presence and is going to be able to really be a game changer when it comes to comes to um, not conceding goals. So I think having a young 2020, 20, 2022, that's the year it is, <laughs> having a young 22-year-old come in who I guess must have been born in 2000, which also makes me cringe thinking about it like that. Um, but bringing in him, I think, is going to be a, a really big move for this club, and I think they're going to be able to kind of mold him into a player that they really see being successful at this position. Yeah, I think not surprising that the Revs decided to bring in a goalkeeper. Yeah. Uh, you think about Jacob Jackson, first-round super draft pick this year. He's also a young goalkeeper, but we've heard him kind of described. I think he's a raw product at this point. You do not want to compare Jacob Jackson 
to Matt Turner. But I'll say this. We hear a lot of the things now about Jacob Jackson that we heard about Matt Turner when he was a young goalkeeper. Yep. Seems to have that innate shot-stopping ability, incredibly raw athletic talent, just needs to fine-tune the rest of the goalkeeping position. And that seems to be kind of the word on Jacob Jackson. So you want Jacob Jackson to have the time to develop with Revolution 2 to get some games and kind of build himself to be that guy because it seems like there's potential there for him. But he's not ready to come in and be your starter right now. And then the fact is you've got two really capable goalkeepers in Brad Knighton and Earl Edwards. But Brad Knighton's 37. Mm -hmm. Earl Edwards is 30. Two players closer to the end of their careers than the beginning. So I think to bring in a younger goalkeeper makes sense. And Elizabeth, you mentioned the term game-changing. I think the Revs really learned over the course of the past few years how valuable it can be mm -hmm. to have a game-changer at the goalkeeper position in Matt Turner, a guy who can go out and can win you games on his own occasionally. And look, we're not going to claim to know a ton about George Petrovic at this point. But that seems to be kind of the early word on Petrovic is he's the type of guy who can make those saves that you don't expect him to make that can maybe end up earning you a few points on his own throughout the course of the season. I think there is tremendous value in that if that's what George Petrovic can come in and be for the revolution. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, sounds great, right? I won't, I won't claim to even attempt to analyze the guy, right? I'll trust the people. You who didn't watch the one minute highlight <laughs> video. I did. I did. There was, one, there was one unbelievable save. Even the coach, I think the opposing team was uh, freaked out. There was one great save, but yeah, who knows? Look, I trust those guys to make those decisions. Um, the idea to bring in a goalkeeper is, is the most important piece that, um, you know, they clearly, we have five keepers on the roster, right? Which looks weird, yeah. but, um, when you, when yeah, it you, won't be like that for long. Right. Obviously, and when yeah. you, when you break it down and go through the process, um, I think investing in a keeper, um, at this type of move was the right move, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at that because I'm gonna sound like an idiot. Although I said I don't uh, I don't spend a lot of time looking at Serbian uh, <laughs> totally. twenty year old goalkeepers. I maybe mean, I sh maybe I should. Maybe but I trust those guys. Yeah, I mean, and it, it's going to your po point, Kahal. Um, like look at some of the players that you know the coaching staff has brought in that have been young. Like Books is a perfect example. I believe he signed when he was 23. And, you know, I, I know it was a weird year when he first started with a pandemic and settling into a new league, but look how successful he's been. So I think the coaching staff has a really good eye for finding that uh, those players that have the ability to grow, that they can mentor and kind of fit into their own system. So yep. um, like you, I have faith in the coaching staff that they're sure. making the right choice. Well, and specifically goalkeeper coach Kevin Hitchcock. Yes. I mean, that was my final point. I tweeted a bunch of stuff about George Petrovic today in terms of his record in Serbia and the highlight package it was put together and all that. And to your point, Kahal, I mean, that's all, you know, obviously, this is a new signing for the refs. We're going to be pumping them up. Yeah. I mean, that's what we're here to oh, do. Don't, I'm, not, I'm not here to but dampen then, that enthusiasm at all. But, but my final point was, look, I don't know a ton about this guy other than what we've seen today. But above all else, if Kevin Hitchcock thinks mm -hmm. that this can be the guy, yeah. then I trust that this can be the guy because Kevin Hitchcock has a great track re record in terms of uh, the goalkeeper position. Yeah, and, and the same goes with how we approach the draft, right? Yeah. Like, like Hitchy identified a player that he thought could be a really good goalkeeper and lobbied hard for us to take him where we took him. So I'll trust him, right? He's, he's demonstrated that he knows what he's talking about. So, yeah. One but I, but it, it, actually identifying the need was, I think, the most important piece, that not to try and patch it together and see what happens once Turner leaves and yeah. muddle their way through the year. They identified someone they wanted and they went and got him, and that's positive. One interesting uh, aspect of this signing been a long, long time since the Revs went out and addressed the goalkeeper position on the international market. I don't know if you saw my tweet earlier today called, do you remember who was the last starting non-American goalkeeper for the New England Revolution? It was actually before, before your time as an employee wow. of the club, so you might not remember. It's been a long time. You think back the goalkeepers this club has used in recent yeah, well, years. Matt, Matt Reese I mean, was here forever. Matt Turner, Matt Reese, yeah. Brad Knighton. Cody Cropper, Bobby Shuttleworth, Jurgen Summer, Aiden Brown. It's been a long, long string of Doug American Warren. goalkeepers. Doug, Doug Warren, Warren was American. Yeah. 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 Jose Carlos Fernandez in 2001 wow. was the last time a goalkeeper who was not American started a match for the New England Revolution. Wow. How about that? Now, fun little bit of trivia. The last international goalkeeper for the New England Revolution, technically. Jose Gonzalez played one minute in 2016, <laughs> uh, as did Shalry Joseph in 2003. So, um, 
But yeah, it's it's been a long time since the Reds have gone this route. Oh. They've gone out on the international market to address the goalkeeper position, but they seem pretty excited about what Georgie Petrovic can do. We mentioned he should be in in the coming weeks. Uh, and certainly a physical goalkeeper. specimen. Yeah, six that, foot that, four. That's not up to debate. Yeah, six foot four goalkeeper certainly has the uh, yeah he has the build to be a a goalkeeper. Uh, and we'll see as he gets settled in uh, as he hopefully arrives within within the next couple of weeks. Um, one one final thing we're gonna. Move on to the Justin Renex interview shortly, but I wanted to note from the Red Bulls game because for me it was the highlight, undoubtedly, the amputee game at halftime Incredible. of the match on Saturday night. This Incredible. is the second time we have had uh, an amputee match at halftime of a Revolution game, and I was I was pumped for this amputee game for like a month leading into this match yeah. because I, I am continuously amazed at the skill and athleticism of these athletes. Some of the things that they are doing with one leg is absolutely insane. I can't, as I'm watching it, I can't quite comprehend how it's happening. Yeah, and, and couple that with just the, the strength um, to do with the, the upper body strength. Yeah. Unbelievable. I mean, it's just, it's incredible to watch. I, it just blows my mind how much the skill, the skill is one of the really good soccer players, regardless of their status. Irregardless. They're, irregardless, sorry. <laughs> really, really good soccer players. a long players. time to do that. Yes, you have. Really, really good soccer players, period. But then just to watch the, just the, what it takes for them to do, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah. To, if you haven't had a chance to see the highlight package that was put together, I mean, there are, there are just some shots where you see, in, in order to kind of hold up your entire upper body with the crutches and then hit what's essentially like a cross-field ball yeah. with one leg, yeah. I, I, can't, I can't quite fathom it. It's unbelievable. Um, it's, a, it's an incredible sport. I urge everybody to go check it out. Yeah. Um, and I'll be honest, uh, everything that I have heard from Nico Calabria, who obviously is at the forefront of mm -hmm. uh, the Revolution amputee team and the U.S. soccer amputee team, said that the Revs are at the forefront of this initiative in terms of partnering with an amputee soccer team and getting them the right equipment and getting them the training time. And Nico would love to make this a full-fledged league and have teams who can play a full schedule and are sponsored by their MLS teams. And um, I just think, I think there's a market for this. Like, this is an incredible sport. There is. And uh, look, the, we, we as clubs and members of MLS, right, and I'm talking to my counterparts and much anybody else, we have to do our part, right? We can yeah. say, uh, you know, it, it, we're all inclusive and soccer for all and you can play and we can do all these things and we can talk the talk, but there's a real opportunity here to actually put some meaning behind something and and help a really, really impactful piece of our sport. And, you know, I'm proud of the efforts we've made locally to, to do that and support this team. And th frankly, the rest of the league should should be should be right there with us. This should be there's no this is a no brainer to reward these athletes for what they're doing. It's incredible. And it's not that much of a lift for us to help them. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, it was incredible to watch their, their game at halftime, and I know that we've seen uh, another game in recent years, and you just you just leave, like, feeling the chills, like, wow, that was so cool to watch. But I think, for me, the part that is even maybe more important than the on-field is the belief that it gives people that, you know, do have um, some sort of issue where they can't perform like a normal physical person would, and the fact that you see them doing this. It's just so inspiring, whether you're in that situation or not, to know that these athletes have, you know, made a, it a priority to do this, and they're inspiring so many other people to do something that's that's incredible. So, um, and I think when we spoke with Nico before the game on Saturday, uh, just hearing his vision vision for the MPG soccer team and um, where he wants to take it and how it's changed his life, how he's changed other people's lives. The, the off the field component too, I think is absolutely inspiring. And I, it gives me so much joy that the revs are at the forefront of a lot of the, that part of that initiative. Yeah. And a huge part of spreading the word about amputee soccer and these opportunities and this, what Nico seemed to be most excited about was the fact that recently he met a young amputee named Isaac yeah. who didn't know until Nico spoke to him, that this opportunity was out there for him, that there is amputee soccer and that he can play the sport that he loves. And to Nico, that's that may be the priority number one, is making sure that young amputees out there know that this sport exists and they, they can get involved at a young age. Um, and there's going to be some more amputee soccer to follow throughout the course of the year because the U.S. amputee team did, did just qualify for the World Cup, which is taking place in October in Istanbul, Turkey. Um, U.S. amputee soccer's big objective now 
Uh, Nico told me they need to raise $150,000 to get themselves to Turkey come October. Um, so hopefully we can get we can get Nico on the podcast uh, in the in the near future. We can talk to him about the Revolution Amputee team and the sport, uh, and we can push to get uh, the money that U.S. Amputee Soccer is going to need to get themselves over to Turkey. Um, so we'll look forward to that at some point. But right now, why don't we get to this week's guest? We're going to be joined shortly on the podcast uh, by Revolution Forward, Justin Rex. Welcome back to the Far Post Podcast presented by eSports Gaming League. We are very excited to be joined now by today's guest, Revolution Forward and South Hamilton Mass native Justin Rennix, who made his second career start last weekend, first since his rookie year in 2019. Justin, really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we spent about 15 minutes before we actually started recording being uh, the rest of us just being complete idiots. So hopefully uh, you've got a taste for what you're about to get into on nah, the Far Post podcast. Good. It's all good. <laughs> you make it sound like that's the only time we spent being complete idiots. Yeah, he Justin just happened to be in the He's room for, for those, those 15, 15 minutes. minutes. Yeah. Are you okay. calling me a complete idiot? Because yes. I know that I'm okay with that. No, you you were mostly quiet during those interactions. I think a lot of me and Cahal going back and forth <laughs> being, <laughs> being total idiots. Good four, save, good 14 save. years in the making. It is what it is. Um, well, Justin, uh, appreciate you joining us. Obviously, it was a big week for you last weekend, uh, getting that start against the, the New York Red Bulls. So I kind of want to start there. Um, you know, when did you get the news from Bruce Arena that you were officially going to be in the starting 11 against the Red Bulls? And then with that being your first first team start in a few years, how did maybe the mindset, the preparation start to shift at that point when you knew you were going to be getting that opportunity? Yeah, so I found out actually when we were watching Red Bulls film. Um, at the end of it, he was like, you're going to be starting this game. I was like, all right do this you know it's been three years since my or two years since my first start I'm like I'm ready to go I'm buzzing and you know that's a big part that you mentioned just like getting mentally ready for it because it's been so long but you know being two years you know working to get to this moment it you you prepared yourself and I was ready to go from minute number one till I think it was the 65th minute I came off so yeah, good. What are those emotions like kind of like pregame? Obviously, you've got the week preparing for the match and you're kind of able to process all those emotions and that preparation. But then what's it like, you know, an hour before the game and you're out warming up, you're putting the jersey on knowing like, OK, this is this is, could be a big night for me. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty. It, it's crazy, it, honestly. It's um, I'm trying to find a good word. I was going to say euphoric, but then <laughs> there was going to we'll be, get a, to that. be a joke. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it was, it's been so long since I've started, so the experience, it was so nice to feel again. And, you know, being out there with all the starters, you know, made me feel at home and just ready to play and play my hardest for these guys. Yeah, and, and there are a lot of guys, obviously, who over the course of the past few years have spent some time with Revolution 2 and the first team. There are some guys who bounce back and forth between the two teams, but it feels like perhaps more so than anyone, you've kind of split your time between those two groups over the past few years. I know you think back to, to 2019, I know you spent on loan in the USL Championship, but then 2020, you come out, you get an opportunity in the home opener against the Chicago Fire, and then the world turns upside down, and we go into a pandemic, and then you're with the team in the bubble. Uh, you were then with Revs 2 for much of the end of the 2020 season, but then you got an opportunity to come in and play in three playoff games with the first team at the end of that year. Then 2021, spent most of the year with Revolution 2. Now at the start of 2022, you're back up getting an opportunity with the first team. So as you're kind of bouncing back and forth, you know, even on a week-to-week, month-to-month basis, how do you kind of keep yourself level knowing, you know, kind of what the objective is week-to-week, even though you don't necessarily know which group you're going to be with? Yeah, I mean, starting from the beginning, it's just you never give up, no matter what. I mean, yeah, I was going up and down, first team, second team, you know, getting missed the first team the second team and you can't let that kind of bring you down at all you just gotta keep going no matter what just keep fighting and your opportunity will come like I've been having this year and you know there was a time where before revolution two existed you know, players in that position who maybe weren't getting the opportunities with the first team you might just train week to week you might just get a bunch of training sessions with the first team and then on the weekend you just go watch the first team game from a suite at Gillette yeah. Stadium, but you've been getting opportunities to play with Revolution 2, high quality minutes. So in what ways do you feel like, you know, training and playing with Revolution 2 on a week to week basis benefited you in a way that maybe just training with the first team week to week, you know, might not have given you? Yeah, I would say it's just mainly getting the minutes in game. So 
those are very important less the training um but yeah just keeping that your feet right on the field you know playing against good competition is always going to benefit you in the long run and for me getting those minutes helped me and you know it transferred t towards the end of those years where I was playing in the playoffs with the first team so I'd go into training and then I'd be performing really well because I've had so many minutes under my belt playing with the second team that you know it kind of translated into me playing more games in the playoffs. I talked with Damian Rivera too about the fact that when when you're getting those minutes with Revolution 2, when Tico's getting those minutes with Revolution 2, it's not just that you're getting minutes on a weekly basis. In those situations, you guys are key players with Revolution 2. There's there's a little bit of weight of expectation. You know, there's some pressure to go out and deliver and be the guy who scores the goals or who sets up the goals. So how valuable can that be for guys like you and Tico who playing with Revolution 2, like I said, you're not just getting minutes, but there's there's sort of that expectation to go out and be the guy. Right. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard when like most of the team looks up to you to you know, score the goal, make stuff happen, and you know, just perform your best every game. You know, that's not easy for anybody. But you know, as in positions like me and Tico, you know, we both go out there every game and give it our all no matter what, and we might not have the best game, we might not score, we might not even win the game at all, but, you know, as long as we're giving it our all, you know, the, the team will have our back no matter what, so. Justin, how do you kind of balance the juxtaposition of being, when you're with Revs 2, like Jeff was talking about, you know, you're a leader, you're someone that people look up to on the field, and then when you go up to the first team, you have a lot of mentors that you can look up to and learn from, so how do you kind of balance the being the guy that's giving out that kind of mentorship and advice with Revs too, and then also being able to learn on your own when you go up to the first team. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a cool little rotation that I never really thought too much about. So, um, can, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? <laughs> you're, you're a leader when it comes to Revs too, but you obviously have the opportunity to be mentored and learn when you come up to the first team. So how do you kind of balance being the person that gives the advice with the younger guys on Revs too, and then being the person that's learning from the first team players? Yeah, so... I would say just trying to take everything I learned from the older guys on the first team and pass it down to the younger guys, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's every training, just keep going, or, you know, don't listen to the coaches sometimes, <laughs> but, like, <laughs> depending on what they're saying, like, yeah. they're getting at you, like, kind of get under your skin, just, like, let Feel it go, it out. you know, they're doing this on purpose to kind of test you, but, you know, it's, it's all... It's all um, experience, and, you know, the more you play, the more you learn. Yeah, definitely. That's cool. How do you feel like your game has evolved between your first team starts? When I started? Yeah, between you went that couple of years between the two first team starts. How do you feel like you've uh, developed as a player in that time? Uh, yeah, I don't even know how to answer that just because it's been – it's so such a difference. I remember that game pretty well. I remember it was against Houston. I was starting at forward with – Juan Fernando Caicedo. Wow. Yeah. Uh, old name. And <laughs> we played a good game. I think it was – we ended up winning. Mm -hmm. But I got subbed off maybe like the 70th, second half. But, yeah, the difference between my game from then and now is pretty drastic. You know, whether it's, you know, my first touch and then just keeping it clean and then keeping it simple especially. You know, sometimes you want to just make something happen. And it's just like not the time, you know, maybe just get the ball, lay it off and then get out, get somewhere dangerous like as a forward should be. I remember interviewing you right after that game on the field. I did a walk off interview with you and uh, we were chatting because you obviously had a lot of stuff going on with uh, like international play at that time, too. And you were talking about your confidence and you've always been a player that's been very confident, like when you were signed and when when you've been playing throughout your career. So how has your confidence increased? Uh, it, a lot. Um, it, confidence is a funny word so it's more so just like believing in yourself mm -hmm. believing in your ability not so much confidence so I go out on the field and I tell myself every day you know you belong here all this all that and then it helps me perform to the best of my abilities so that's awesome you got to have the self-belief yep I know you said you remember you won that game against the Houston Dynamo. Do you remember who the goal scorers were in that win over Houston? Because I do. <laughs> <laughs> do you just was remember it, or did you look it up? No, I remember. He might have. What's that? Juan Agudelo. Agudelo did not score in that uh, game. 
a good guess. The winner, it was a late Teal Bunbury stoppage time winner in that okay. one. The other wow. goal, Antonio De La Mea. Wow. wow. Yeah, a rare Antonio De La Mea yeah, header off a set piece. Uh, yeah, wow. I, do, I do remember that one. Did he score in the Houston Storm game at home too? So he's multiple career goals against Houston? Uh, no, I think those goals, the Storm game, was that uh, Agudelo and Jose Gonzalez? Oh, was it? I feel it? like Gonzalez scored in that game. Ah, uh, that wasn't. That wasn't. Yeah, that was like that was fifteen or sixteen, game. maybe. That was bananas. Yeah, that was a, that was a nuts game. They're old, yeah. Justin. We haven't been here as long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's okay to say. <laughs> uh, it's one thing too. I feel like when when this building was built, the training center was built. There was a lot of talk about how it was set up to have Revolution Two downstairs, to have the locker room downstairs. Revolution Two's meal room is downstairs. Everything they do is pretty much downstairs then you've got the first team space upstairs with the locker room and the meal room and the gym and all that and they kind of talked about how that was set up intentionally to kind of have players who when they're with revolution two are kind of working every single day to say i gotta get back upstairs like did you do you feel that at all when you're with revolution two saying you know what i gotta go out today i gotta put in the work because i want to get myself back up there yeah every training every training you want to you want to get back up there no matter Sorry, I kind of butchered that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, trying to think of a good response. Yeah, I mean, I, I think mean, it's pretty pretty clear that that I mean that's the way it's set up, right? It's to, it's kind of that that stairway saying a yeah. literal there's a literal stairway. I never thought of it <laughs> like that, but if they set it up like that, then sure. It seems like it's Absolutely. working. It seems like it's working because I know uh, obviously work ethic for you is a big thing, and that's where you earned a lot of praise on Saturday and that start against the Red Bulls. Earned praise from. The coaching staff and from fans saying, you know, in the 65 minutes you were on the field, you were putting in the work. Is how how important is that for you in terms of an attribute? Every time, not only you're on the, f on, you know, in the starting eleven during a game day, but on the training ground, making sure that that you're putting in the work every time yeah. you have an opportunity. I stand by my work rate, and I'll always work as hard as I do, no matter what. I mean, in some cases, hard work beats talent. So if I can't do what I want to do on the ball then do it off the ball and just work your hardest that's work. the only reason i'm anywhere because i have no talent whatsoever so right. it's all about you've just work. been grinding since day one yeah <laughs> yeah you have. those are words of wisdom for sure an inspiration uh just briefly looking kind of ahead to to this miami game this weekend what's kind of the vibe within the group right now because you put in a pretty good shift on saturday just a really unlucky way obviously <laughs> to end that game against brutal. the red bulls one of the most brutal ways i've seen a, a oh game end um but it just kind of compounded on top of all the other recent results and everything. So just what's kind of the vibe within the group? You come off that Red Bull game, you're getting ready for a big nationally televised game now on Saturday against yeah, Miami. You just you forget about it because that was super unlucky, and you just move on and play our next game. You know, we don't listen to any of the whatever people are saying behind us, trying to get at us, like we're a like, bad record. Who cares? Like we're just doing our thing. We're going to bounce back no matter what. Like we're a great team and we have so much potential and we're going to show the MLS that like we're, we're still the best team in the conference and the league. Seems like Bruce is the king of that too, right? Like I don't, I think Bruce is pretty much pretty consistently at a six or seven. Like it seems like yeah. that's just kind of his, his motto. You don't get too high. You don't get too low. doesn't matter how things are going. We're going to attack every day the same all the time. Yeah. Who's your toughest opponent in the training? Anyone leave one on you just to remind you? <laughs> um... Sometimes well, it was usually defenders. So before it was usually be me going against like Kessler and Farrell. But I, honestly, it's sometimes Polster. All right. Yeah, Polster. Will I can see that. Yeah, yeah that, make, that makes sense. Yeah. Just remind Polster you. We'll get into it sometimes <laughs> and get some studs going. I think occasionally. <laughs> but it's all good. It's all good. Love that. That's, how, that's just how he plays. You, you know, need it, right? Blame him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think occasionally Polster's just walking up in the hallways up here and he just goes <laughs> in on a tackle on somebody <laughs> <laughs> just to make sure everybody knows. Oh yeah. He's just getting the practice in. Um, Justin, before we let you go, I did. I told you we wanted to. Uh, we're going to keep it a little bit light on the show, as we always do. And I, had, I have to bring this up because we were out on the training ground the other day as you guys were getting ready for the Red Bull game, and you scored a goal. And as soon as you scored, a bunch of your teammates started yelling "Euphoria, Euphoria, Euphoria," and they were clearly referencing you <laughs> and the television show Euphoria. I personally have never seen the show, but I have seen the actor Angus Cloud, who I assume uh, they're referencing. You you look like yeah. has this is this something that's been been going on? Like, did do does anyone actually call you Euphoria? Was that just like a one time thing? Like, get, bring me through the Euphoria nickname at all? 
Yeah, so like you, I haven't seen the show at all. But Andrew Farrell made a... I knew it was <laughs> Andrew. He yeah. always does it with like yeah. the Game of Thrones and stuff too. Yep. So he was the one who originally said it. Yeah. And he's honestly still the only one that says it to me. So he showed me a picture one day. I was like, all right, dude. Like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and it was right after I got my, like, haircut. Not, like, brand new, like, new cut. It was, like, before the Red Bull. I don't know. It was a week ago or something. Mm -hmm. And he pulled up a picture and showed me it. And I was just like, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you, but. I was gonna ask how you how you feel about it if there's if, if you're like all right cool like yeah I guess I guess no, that I makes don't sense. mind this one it was the other one the Game of Thrones one that oh made me angry yeah yeah whatever it is I uh, oh the the king yeah the yeah king. oh they that's brutal with that. yeah. yeah that's yeah. not cool no yeah, no I didn't like that one. <laughs> no I was I know you haven't seen the show as well but Joffrey. Joffrey, Joffrey, Joffrey yeah. yes, yeah, that wasn't. That's not cool. No, yeah, we can cut this out too. <laughs> <laughs> the character they're referring to on Euphoria, I was saying, uh, is probably the most likable character on the show. Right. So I don't think it's. I mean, they're you know, it's the the contents of the show are a little heavier. But overall, if you're going to be named any of those characters, that's the best one okay. for sure. Good. Then we'll keep that one. Not yeah. Joffrey. I yeah. say my only experience with Angus Cloud is the interview that he gave at the on the red carpet at the finale for yeah. Euphoria. Um, have you seen that interview? Oh, it's familiar with that I one. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, Hysterical. Tragic. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> oh, no. I will say I wanted so badly when you came into the press conference after the game on Saturday. Oh, yeah. I wanted so badly oh, to you. ask you, you know, what, what emotions are you feeling having started that first game and in a few years and have you just go, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect response. Yeah, so next time, next time you get an opportunity to answer a question in a press conference, no, thank you. Yeah. Just feel free. If you throw that in there, it's going to be internet gold. It's going to go viral. It's Saturday. After you, after you bang in the winner on Saturday, you can remember to do that. But yeah. he's going to want to talk about that. So you got to give plenty of time to talk about it. Plenty of time to talk about it. Yeah, you got to answer a couple <laughs> questions that, so that you could talk about that. For and then sure. at the end, be like, last one. No, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you anybody stay. asks, if, if it's because she had asked specifically, you know, what are what are your emotions? And he was just like, no, I'm not talking about emotions. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so if someone asks you about your emotions after a game, just be like, no, thank you. As long as you throw in the thank you, you're fine, right? Like that's true. Polite. You know, you're being you're being nice. Uh, well, Justin, uh, we appreciate you taking the time to stop by. Uh, congrats on the start this past weekend. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to seeing you on the field much more throughout the 2022 season. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right, we'll be back shortly to wrap things up on the Far Post Podcast presented by Esports Gaming League. Welcome back to the Far Post Podcast presented by Esports Gaming League as we now briefly look ahead to Saturday afternoon's nationally televised visit to Inter-Miami CF. This game kicks off at 3 p.m. Eastern time. That is a change from the originally announced kickoff time. It's 3 p.m. Eastern time on Saturday from Driv Pink Stadium. I yeah. think that's how you say it, right? Drift I, think, Pink. I think it's what it is. Drift Pink Stadium. Uh, interesting tangent on that game. Elizabeth, you're closer to younger people, so you might, you might know this. Um, is, is one of the Beckhams getting married this weekend? I'm going to be honest, I don't know. I heard, like, Brooklyn's getting married or something. I'm, like, flabbergasted that he's old enough to marry anybody. Is that, what age is oh. that? Let's do a little research on that. I know the, the Beckham child news that I keep hearing is I think that Romeo, Romeo Beckham was had in their three academy, assists, right? and he had three assists in uh, in Inter Miami too. Yeah. Or no, I don't know if they're Inter Miami. Someone mentioned to me anymore. yesterday that um, there was a big wedding down there this weekend. Oh, I, like, I don't know. Are the revs crashing the wedding? I'm like, what wedding are you talking about? They're like, I think Brooklyn's getting married. I'm like, what? No, wasn't there? I thought there was news recently. I'm uh, well out of the loop. It didn't didn't Brooklyn Beckham just go through a big breakup? Wasn't that the big news that Brooklyn Beckham had gone through a breakup? I have no idea. Oh, dear, <laughs> I think that I don't even know what age I think the kid is. True. I think they're getting married. I'm not sure on I the date. I thought he just went through a big breakup. Maybe this I made that This one's dated up. March 31st. What yeah. age is he? Uh, 22. Oh, my God. 22. Mm. Brooklyn Beckham is 22. No, you're right. On um, April 9th this year. Oh, look at that. Revs but, are crashing the wedding. Wow. Oh, but wow. Uh, how does that make sense? I mean, I guess David Beckham's not going to the game, right? <laughs> Bex is going to be sidetracked. Maybe, maybe, it's at, maybe he's getting oh, married on the field. Wow. Oh. Maybe they're getting married on the field. That's yeah. big time. Wow. Well, oh. they, they How met about at, that? They met at Coachella four, four years ago. Uh, she's 27. Oh, good like. for him. 
And yeah, isn't her wow. dad like a gajillionaire or something too, I believe? Uh, the term gajillionaire is not used in this article, okay. but I'll do a little more research on that. I believe he is. I think, I think the rich are getting richer. <laughs> it's in well, Palm yeah. Beach, Florida. Uh, that is not where Miami plays. All right. No, then, no, no, no. So it seems like it's out of, yeah. uh, out of so town. So Bex won't be there. Won't be at the game, no. Sorry, I had it wrong. Apparently, it's Cruz Beckham, who is 17, who had gone through a recent breakup that was in the news. Gotcha. So the Beckham kids, are, they're all over the place. One's getting married. One just broke up. One's so does it racking go, up does assists. It's Brooklyn Romeo Cruz? Is I that think the so. order? That's the batting order? <laughs> I think so. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It looks that sounds, like that they're, right. they're going to be the best men at the wedding, it looks like, both of them. So none of them are going to the game. None of, them, none of the Beckhams will be at the game, no. They don't care at all. They're absentee <laughs> owners. <laughs> and, oh, uh, apparently... Uh, yeah, David Beckham is the master of ceremonies. Of course he is. Yes, yes. As he is in every room he, he's yeah, ever in. He can't just go be dad. No. <laughs> the former Spice Girls will be in attendance. Yes. Wow, I'm oh, learning wow. a lot oh, here. Come on. The, the whole group? I hope Jerry Halliwell trashes uh, the place. Emma, Bunton, Mel C, Mel B, Jerry. Uh, so four of them, um, it looks like. Yeah, there's only four, four, four Spice Girls. There was five. No, there's five. There's five. Scary, I don't know which one sporty, well, but imagine baby. I would posh, imagine David posh. Beckham's wife would probably be the other one that would be Who are we missing? Right? Scary, sporty, oh, yeah, baby, right. posh, and who? Wait, uh, scary, sporty, posh, baby. Um, I don't know who wow, we're missing. Why is this? I'm missing. <laughs> so Mel B was Scary Spice. Mel C was Sporty Spice. I don't Emma know Emma was names. Baby Spice. Posh is Victoria Beckham. Who was Jerry Halliwell? What was her name? Trampy Spice or something? No, that's not right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> What was her name? Spice Girls. Hello. Wasn't Ginger, ginger, ginger Spice. Spice. Ginger Spice. Yes, ginger Spice. 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 Doesn't yes, sound right. Yes. Ginger Spice. All right. There yes. it is. I'm glad right. I got that. Ginger Spice. That's right. Wow. Learning wow. a lot about this. <laughs> We're just going to post this. Whether or not the, <laughs> the Far Post podcast trailer, too, yes. Whether or not the Spice Girls those. will be performing remains uh, to be seen. Well, they're going to perform. I mean, oh, it's, it's questioning it in here. I don't know if it's for sure. Tremendous. What does Bruce get an invitation? Wait, apparently Gigi Hadid is... Oh, she, she'll, she'll be there? I mean, this is crazy. Lots of stuff going on. Wow. Might need to make a, a pit stop in Palm Beach on the way home. Yeah, might Ooh. have to... Crash the, crash the wedding. Wedding crashes, yeah. there you go. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Becky G's going and she could bring Sebastian and we can all sneak in with Sebastian. There you go. I think I think that we could do that. I think that's a, that's a good shot. Right. Rev's on good. tour. Let's go. Yeah. Wow, there's a lot of stuff. The the Duch and Dush, uh, Duchess sorry, are coming. What? what did you call them? <laughs> no, the Duke. I, mean, I fully support that type of terminology for the royal family, but I'm not sure that's how they pronounce it. And I, I mean, I've just been watching too much Bridgerton, so hearing these terms in real life for a wedding this weekend is hysterical. Um, <laughs> the, the Douche and Duchess of York is fantastic. I love it. <laughs> it's great. As an Irishman, I, I fully Duke, support that. The Duke and Duchess. Maybe I stuttered. Um, wow, yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Anyway, yeah, and there's, a game. A, and a, there's typical, a game. It's a typical weekend in Miami. Yes. It really is. And there's a game, right? There is a game. Three really? o'clock on Saturday afternoon from Drift Pink Stadium. Maybe that's why the game's early, so that <laughs> anybody who needs to be there can get there. Maybe that's why they changed the kickoff. That's that what could it be. Was. That could be. Ooh. Brooklyn we, really wanted to go to the game. We solved the mystery. <laughs> yeah, we Brooklyn solved really it. wanted to go to the game. We said, Dad, move the game up a few hours. He, he said, said, no problem, okay. son. Okay. <laughs> Fort Lauderdale, let's go. Watch Apparently. the game and then hit the reception. Yeah, to get that one approved by ESPN because it's an ESPN game. They'll do whatever for David Beckham. Bex tells yeah. them. Fair. It's also available in Spanish on ESPN Deportes. It'll be available on the local radio call with the uh, local crew, 98.5, the sports hub. Um, and we kind of touched upon it earlier in the show, right? It's early April. There's only so important a game can be in Major League Soccer in early April. Like there's a there's a cap on how important an early season April game can be. Yes. Uh, in Major League Soccer because this, we have, this is up against the cap. We have seen teams uh, have absolutely disastrous entire first halves of seasons yes. and come back. It happens in Major League Soccer relatively that's the frequently. Joy, that's the joy of the format. Um, so there's no, you know, there's no must-win games in, in April. There's no hugely critical games in April. It's just the the nature of the league. But as we mentioned earlier, it feels like a, a potential inflection point because yes. it is a Miami team uh, that have lost four straight. They're they not all, very good. All by multiple goals. Three goals scored is fewest in Major League Soccer. They're not very good. 13 goals against is second most in Major League Soccer. As a 10-goal differential, I'm really good at it math. It is a 10-goal differential. <laughs> well done. Um, Thank you. <laughs> and, and to Elizabeth's point earlier in the show, it does feel like you know, you'll take three points anyway you can get them at this point. But I think it could be really important for the Revs to go out and not just pick up three points, but to get a, just a remind statement people, kind of Just win. remind people who we are. Yeah. yeah. Just remind people. That's all. Yeah. You know, it's easy to sort of be like, oh, Revs, whatever. Just remind them. Lay a little reminder down. This is who we are. 
Well, the last time they went down to Miami, the only time they went to Miami uh, in Fort Lauderdale, a 5 no win mm. against this Inter Miami team last year. So if the Reds can put together a performance like that on Saturday, I think that'll go a long I'll way. Take it. Uh, in terms of might put a down on the a little bit. reception, but <laughs> yeah. that's okay. Yeah, who cares? Yeah, um, more th- drinks then, right at the open bar. That's right. <laughs> really, there there I'm are. I'm sure Beckham does open bar. Right? He probably does. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I'd lean that way. Yeah, he probably does. Um, oh, gee, he's not footing the bill, right? He's farther the bride pays for it. Yeah, I got. I guess that's fair. That's gonna be a tough one, right? I, I guess think, depending on who the father of the bride is. I think is. the father of the bride might have more money than Beckham. I, I, I believe he's an extremely wealthy individual. Oh, I, okay. Yeah. I didn't even know who I, I think he's extremely wealthy. I feel like in some of those situations, though, like there's the, I don't want to say ego component, but oh, I'll chip in for this part or I'll pay for the yeah. personal dinner. Like I'm sure, that, I'm sure there's some mixing and matching, but you're probably right, father of the bride. That's tradition, right? The kajillion dollar wedding. <laughs> you, got, you got two of them coming, right? What? You're a father of two <laughs> brides. You got to pay for it twice, man. Yeah, they're 11 and Ooh, 6. Well, so I'm just telling you, man, you got to start saving, bro. I got college Ooh. to worry about first. Oh, you don't even tell me about that. Anyway, yeah. anyway. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. Well, it's just to make a, a final point about the game on Saturday. When you look at the Revolution, who obviously need to go into to Fort Lauderdale and put together uh, a really solid performance just to kind of get things on track here because they're certainly, at the moment, a little bit, a little bit off track. Need to get on track. Uh, some questions around the Revs' forward line heading into this game. Adam Books is suspended for Saturday's game after yep. he was sent off in stoppage time of that loss to the Red Bulls. Gustavo Bo has been dealing with an injury. We don't know what his status is ahead mm-hmm. of this weekend. Josie Altador came off at halftime of the game against the Red Bulls with what Richie Williams said was a little bit of an injury. We yep. don't know his status. Edward Kizza just sent on loan to Memphis. Yep. Could potentially leave our guest on this week's Far Post podcast, Justin Rennix, as the only healthy forward on the roster heading into Saturday's game in Miami. So if that is the case, if Justin, if Justin Rennix is your only healthy available forward on Saturday, how is it that you set up the front three, front four, Get whatever it is? Get me Tico. Get three me Tico. Three goals in the first yeah. two seasons. Let them play. This is, the, yeah. this is the game. Let the two of them play. See what I happens. Agree. That's what we're here for. I think also, too, you're going to have a lot of your uh, outside backs getting forward in this one as well. So, I mean, hopefully there's a way that you can kind of play the strengths of the other players on the field to kind of leverage the attack. I really see Dewan Jones and Brandon By if they're starting getting forward and doing all of that. So, I'm with you. Let's start Tico and Get we've got Tico. other people that can score. Let's not. I don't want to change formations and break the whole team down to try no. and do something funky. Let's give the kid a chance. See yeah. what he's got. This is the game to do it. Yeah. Three goals in the... Uh, and Revs 2's first two games of the season for Damian Rivera. He's a player who consistently gets high marks with what he gives this Revs team in the attack. I know there's still, he's a young player. They want him to develop the rest of his game. But everything I hear about Damian Rivera is that going forward, he's there. He yeah. can contribute at the MLS level in the attack right now. Let's give him a um, shot. If it's not, if it's not Tico, you know, I think you can you can set it up in a way where at least get get Renex up top and then get guys like Boateng, yeah. Legit heel all around him. So yeah. you're not you can't you don't want to leave Justin Renex on an island making his third career MLS start. No, you, you have options certainly with so there's some versatility around the rest of the bench. I just don't know how many opportunities you're going to get to to throw a Tico in there and see what happens. And this seems to be a, a good one. So let's yeah. take advantage. That would be easy for me to say sitting here. Right? It's not <laughs> my job, right? But um, that's what I would do. Thank God. I know, right? <laughs> Good Lord. (laughs) All right. We will see what the coaching staff does in terms of the starting 11 on Saturday. Big one for the Revs. Big one for Miami as well. Three Eastern time on ESPN. Get to get on the sauce nice and early on Saturday. It's good. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Get after it, Revs fans. Barbecue sauce, right? Revs at Inter-Miami CF. Uh, Well, look, that'll do it for this week, right? I think so. Maybe, so. maybe we'll be back for another show next week. We we'll can see. give it a go. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Let's see how the result goes on Saturday. Yeah, we, can, we can figure it yeah. out. Hopefully, hopefully we, uh, it's another big win for the Reds uh, like, the, like the last time they went down to, to drive Pink Stadium. And uh, we're coming back talking about a, a 4-5-0 or five nil win, and we can have a nice little happy show. And maybe we should have Sebastian on next week to debrief us on the wedding. That's true. Yeah. He is definitely going to be at that wedding. Right. No question about right. it. Um, I can also put in an early request for one of the Beckhams or just somebody who has met one of the Beckhams at any point. We've got a few get, of them in the building. Get Ginger Spice. Oh, no so one remembers her name anyway. She'll <laughs> come on the show. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> how, how much could she be in demand if nobody even remembers <laughs> right, her exactly, name? Exactly, exactly. Like, what was he, who's the other one? Yeah. yeah First get her question, up. which Spice were you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. I, I, either way, uh, whenever, whenever it is, we'll see you next time, whenever it may be, on the Far Post Podcast, presented by Esports Gaming League.